in computing, what is, who can tell me, what is the most efficient input method? What is the way, there's lots of input methods, right? So what is the way that's the most efficient? The mouse. The mouse, <laughs> right. Why? Touch screen. Okay. So feel what I'm doing. Right, yes. Neural interface. Neural interface. Well, now you got me beat, but... <laughs> So it's the keyboard, right? Because the keyboard, even with a touch screen, so let's say you have an on-screen keyboard on a touch screen. Yes, theoretically, you have infinite input because you can modify you know, which key is doing what. But uh, the keyboard gives you feedback. So you know absolutely for certain that you hit the T key. You don't have to think twice. So uh, with that in mind, some people have been thinking, well, how how can I take advantage of this? I've got this computer, and I've got this keyboard, and I want to use my computer with my keyboard, and I don't have to worry about switching inputs to go to the mouse to do things. Um, obviously, if I'm doing graphics, that's a different story. I'm going to have to deal with it. But just for basic window management, things like that, I want to use the keyboard for as much as possible. And actually, so uh, in my, my current job, I work for Penn Manor School District, um, you might have heard of them. They do a lot of open source things. So I got the chance to jump into Linux and be using Linux for work. So when I did that, I thought, well, this is the chance that I've got. I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to just be more effective in, the, in a terminal and, and using keyboard for as much as I can. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So the first part of this is the window manager. So what I've done is I've switched to i3, which is a tiling window manager. So I'm going to show you that. And basically, I'm going to show you all the other tools that I'm currently using, as many as I can show you here today. So let me switch over to uh, the folder that I've got this in. And I set this box up just for today. So I'm just going to blow all this away. This isn't normally how I have stuff. but. Um, okay, so here I've got a couple of um, couple of programs that I'm gonna that I'm gonna show you here. Let's expand this a little bit. Okay, so uh, Vim. Um, who can tell me what Vim is? Text editor. text editor, right? Okay, so that's gonna be kind of important because we're gonna be using a lot of text editing. We're gonna be editing all of our configuration files in text. Um, and we're going to be, we're just going to be using text a lot. So, and that's just kind of the way Linux works in general anyway. So having a good text editor is a good idea. Now, I use Vim. There are people here that use Emacs. If you use Emacs, raise your hands. I'm curious. Who are my Emacs people? Have, have really? Used it or still use it? Still use it. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Emacs has its advantages. So. Biggest core difference between Vim and Emacs is the philosophy behind how you use it. In Vim, we have different modes. We have like five different modes. I only ever use two or three. Um, but we have modes of input. So in one mode, I'm typing. In another mode, I'm modifying text and moving around. Um, in Emacs, everything is right at your fingertips. You're already writing. You're already modifying text. So in Emacs now you're you're using modifiers to do advanced uh, manipulation. Is that accurate, Chris? That is that an accurate comparison of Vim and Emacs? That Emacs is more just uh, you're in <laughs> you're already in the editing mode all the time. So now you're just going to use modifiers to make advanced edits. Yeah. So essentially. In Emacs, you don't have to type in a command first before you're allowed to start right. typing in your document. Right, exactly. Yep. So, in a sense, it might be easier for beginners to jump into Emacs. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, it's with either of them, it's a learning curve because for every action, there's a faster way to do it if you learn what the what the key combination is. We'll get into that just a little bit because I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, I3, I3 is a window manager. There are other window managers. Awesome is one. That's a good tiling window manager. Um, I3 is the one I'm on for now. We're going to get into I3 blocks and fed just because that kind of goes with the window manager there, and we'll talk about that. Then we're going to look at Tmux. And Tmux and screen is kind of like the Vim and Emacs battle. Tmux, uh, screen 
is the older of the two, but screen basically lets you. We'll we'll talk about that later. We'll look at Ranger Mutt, and uh, we won't get to see Mutt really, but then we'll see Calcurs and WeChat. All right. So the first thing, I3. So this is basically, these are the commands I typed in here, and then underneath of it is kind of the configuration file. So I've already installed I3, so all I have to do now, and we'll see how this works with the multiple screens. I don't know how that's going to work. I'm going to log out, and I'm going to log back in using the I3 window manager. So all I typed to get the I3 window manager installed was, um, I just typed apt-get install I3. So now, uh, in my demo box here, and this is just vanilla Ubuntu, I figure, to get into it, uh, you, you're familiar with Ubuntu, hopefully, so this will be easy. Right here next to your username is a little dot, and that dot represents the window manager. So once you've installed more than one window manager, you can jump in and change it from there. So I'm going to switch down to i3. You can actually add an icon to that to make it prettier than a, you know, just a white dot, because it's kind of boring. Um, just takes a little bit of time. So the first time you log in um, to uh, i3, you're going to get this message, and it's not very clear because um, we can't we can't work really much with this resolution. But it says uh, you don't have any configuration for i3. What do you want to do? And basically say, okay, yeah, I want to I want to go ahead and make my configuration. It's going to then ask you, what do you want to be your modifier key? And the default is the super key. Windows key, um, and then you can also use Alt if you want to use that. I like the default. That's pretty good. All right, so now we're done. This is the i3. Ta-da. So pretty. Yeah. It's very fully featured, so as you can see. Now, uh, in order to do anything, so I can move my mouse. That's exciting. And uh, I, can, I can click, but that doesn't do anything either. All right. Let me, the very first thing I'm going to have to do is I'm going to open a terminal. So to do that, I'm going to hold super and hit enter. So that opens a terminal. Now, my window is different here, so I'm going to have to try something here. X, R, and R. And I'm going to have to say, I'm going to read it. Um, I'm using LVDS1 and VGA1. And which one's bigger? So um, VGA1 is going to be. Uh, X, that's what I'm going to try to do. X, R, and R. Output VGA1. Same as LVDS-1. Does that look right? We're going to find out. Too late. Ah! There it is. Well, that's still small. Um... Well, let's see. Is it the same as your laptop screen? It's the same resolution. Okay. <laughs> we'll just do that to kind of make it a little easier to see. But now I can see what's going on, and you can see what's going on, so this works. Okay, so I can move my mouse, and I can click in here, and I can interact with it. Um, but you'll see at the top here, there's there's a a bar, but there's no close window. There's no, I mean, there's a file menu because that's the inside the application. But there's nothing else going on. So what do I do? Well, I can uh, I can close this, uh, and and with i3 you can configure this. We'll see the configuration file in a minute. You can configure this to do anything you want. So it's all key combinations, and in fact you can set up a key combination to be a script, which means the possibilities are endless here, and it, it's just super efficient. So if I want to uh, just close this, what I'll do is I'll say super shift q. That will close it, so that you know that gets me back out of it. Super enter opens a terminal. Super enter again opens it over here. So what you'll notice is it's kind of very faint in this um, in this theme, but if I hold um, the super key and I go to V and I go to H. Do you notice it's really faint, but you see the line at the bottom that shows up and disappears? line on the right shows up and disappears. You see that as I hit that? So if I hit V, what it's going to do is that brighter line down here at the bottom means that's where the next window is going to go. So if I hit now, if I hit super enter, it tiles it there. So now I can have, I can have things tiled as, many, as often as, as many as I want, really. 
Um, and then, of course, to get out of them, it's the just uh, super shift Q. And we're back. OK, so that part's pretty easy. All right, let's see what I have in my home directory right now for configuration. Not much. I have a bashrc file and a profile folder. Uh, let's, let's see. So what I did is I copied my configuration files to save time, because usually you set this up once. You don't go um, through the same pane twice um, unless you really want to learn it. So what I did is um, I copied all of my configuration files to um, to varshare, and I just made a folder in varshare and gave everybody access to it. So, um, so here we've got my different configuration files. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy my uh, i3 configuration files into here. So first of all, I'm going to make um, a folder called .i3. And of course, dot .files are hidden, so we're not going to see that. So it won't clutter up my folder. But um, now, if I see what's in there, um, I've got a config file. So my config file, let's copy that over. So if I copy var share i3 config to dot .i3 config, and now, if I vim config, this is the i3 configuration file that, that we have here. Um, and as I go down through, um, here's where it sets the uh, modifier key. And then um, it just is, it's kind of self-explanatory. All the comments there kind of tell you what's going on. So if I hit. Um, Somewhere in here, there's a restart uh, where it tells you uh, when i3 restarts, load this configuration file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that. And it's super shift r uh, reloads the, um, win the window manager and reloads that configuration. So you can see all the colors changed. And um, mine's pretty ugly. You can make it a whole lot prettier. There are some really great examples out on the web. Um, but this is just how I use it. So for instance, for me, um, I like to have the, um, the color to determine uh, which one is, which direction is the next one is going to be in bright green, because I feel like I can see it. It's very ugly, but it works. So it just kind of depends on how you use it. So it's, it's very customizable. Um, something else that we see here, down here at the bottom right, there's a, an error that says error status command process. Ex so normally down in that bottom right, that's where you want to have your status. You want to see what time it is, um, system information, anything that you would want to put there. And again, you can customize it with scripts. So let's see what's going on there. If I go to the bottom of my configuration file, I go up a little bit here. Here's my bar. So for me, I'm using um, I'm using i3 blocks, which uh, doesn't come with um, it doesn't come with i3 necessarily. So for instance, uh, let's just switch over to that file for all the installs here. So my um, so basically, these are the commands I've run. I've run apt-get install i3, and then apt-get install i3 blocks gives me i3 blocks. So the only problem is now we also need the configuration. Oh, great. Oh, OK, hang on. OK, here we go. All right. So sometimes i3, when you make changes and you don't exit and reload the window manager, you have to exit and reload the window manager because it gets very upset at you. So um, super shift E will do that. Most of the time, if you're making simple changes, it's not going to matter. Um, but in this case, it wasn't very happy about that. 
So we're going to open that back up and we're going to do somewhere up here there was XR and R. Okay. <coughs> okay. So let's see. So I can switch now between one and two. So I'm going to SU Guru Pilgrim just to show that. Okay, so I3 blocks. All right, so down at the bottom right here we have that. If I look at my configuration right now, um, I have in, in I3, all I have is my config file. Um, so what I need is an I3 blocks, uh, an I3 blocks configuration file. So I'm gonna copy that from my share. and reload my window manager and now down here I've got some things going on. So I've got my time and my CPU. You'll see these weird characters. That's because I'm using uh, a font called Font Awesome which basically takes the um, um, private use section of Unicode and says hey well let's put some icons here. So that's what it does. A um, bunch of interesting icons. Of course I didn't install that on this but um, gives you the idea. So you can basically put anything you want down there um, and make some interesting, uh, gives you great feedback. So that's that. Any questions so far? Yeah. I don't know if you this earlier in the but uh, what are the dependencies for i3? If I'm using Linux Linux, will I be able to, to run this if you know less? Um, I don't know offhand. There, you can get a list of them if you like Google what are the dependencies. There's, there's a list of them. Um, it's not a lot though, in, especially in comparison to other window managers. I'm pretty sure Mint um, is going to, because it's kind of close to that Ubuntu track, is going to have everything Ubuntu. All I need is literally the i3, so I don't have to install anything special. And it's light. Like it's, it's like maybe 20 packages. So, uh, all right. So we got that. Now, if I go over here, this is still this stock Ubuntu wallpaper, and that's kind of boring. So let's see what we can do about that. In my configuration, um, I have somewhere here, I have, now I'm using Vim here, so I want to find, um, I want to find Feb because I know I'm using it. So if I do a forward slash in, in the bottom here, that kind of says, hey, I'm going to do a search now. So I'm going to type Feb. And there, it's going to take me right to that spot in my configuration file. So right now, this is from my computer. I have a picture in pictures that I'm using in my configuration file for my wallpaper. Well, I don't have that picture on this computer, so I need to change that. So I'm going to come over here, and I want to change this whole, the rest of this line. I don't want to change the whole line. I want to change just the rest of this line. So in Vim, I have the ability to do that just with a keyboard shortcut. So normally, if I want to change word, I can say CW, and that changes just that word. But this is more than the word that I want to change, so that doesn't help me out. So I want to change basically from here to the end. So to do that, I hit C for change, and dollar sign for go to the end of the line. And now I've got the rest of that line, which is something that's kind of common to come across. And I just have it in there. I just have a, an image, simple image. So I've now saved my configuration file. We'll come over here to uh, an empty window that I'm not using. And I'm going to say, let's reload the window manager. And now we've got a new wallpaper. So that's the basics of um, that configuration for i3. Is that all making sense so far? OK. So we're going to go on to uh, some other things. All right, Tmux. So if I, let's quit out of here. Um, Tmux gives me the ability to have more than one terminal session open at the same time. I'm going to explain this wrong. Chris is staring at me. <sighs> no pressure. Okay. 
more than, <laughs> more than one no terminal way. session uh, in a terminal window at the same time. So, as an example, I'm going to type tmux, and I'm going to say I want a new tmux session. So we're going to do that. And then I have to give it a session name. For me, I've been in the habit of just saying S1, S2 for just some, for my, you know, basic session. A lot of times I'll just open tmux. I just want tmux in one place. And I'm not switching a lot between them. Um, so that's what I do. So now what's happened is, at the bottom of my terminal, I have a green line here that says kind of what my terminal is. It says it's bash, uh, and that's zero. So S1 right here in the corner, that's the session name, and then zero is the number of the buffer, and then the name of the, of the application running in the buffer, uh, and then some other system information over here. Tmux is just a, as com customizable as i3 is, to the point that I've seen some Tmux configs that make you feel like it's its own world. It's kind of incredible. So they have, like, you can have weather apps and things that you can literally put in, in you know, shell scripts, basically that end up displaying anything you want in Tmux. Um, what I like then with the customizability is... This is, is default or did you set this up? This is default. Okay. Um, and I'll show you that in a minute. I'm going to copy my config over. Um, so what I do in my config is I use Tmux on a remote server too. So I need to... Um, let me explain this first. If I want to make a new buffer, uh, basically I say control B and then I hit C. So control B enters me into the command mode for Tmux. So now anything I type on the keyboard, the next character is going to tell Tmux what I want it to do. So it doesn't seem like anything happened there, but at the bottom we have um, a zero with a bash and a one with a bash. Let's just open something up here. Let's just hit top. And now top is running. And now down here at the bottom, if you can see it, it says top is in uh, buffer one. So now if I hit uh, control B and I type zero, that takes me back to um, that takes me back to my first buffer. And I can kind of switch back and forth. So I can say control B one takes me to buffer number one. Control B zero takes me to buffer number zero. So that's the default. Um, so now if I if I'm on a remote server, that server has Tmux and I want to use Tmux over there. If I hit Control-B, it's going to be like, well, uh, Tmux on my computer well, is going to interfere. So what I do is I set it up for Control-A to be on my computer so that the defaults for Tmux somewhere else work just beautifully. Do you have a question? So for Tmux, do you require some sort of uh, graphical Windows system? Or like you can, it's a command, so you can do Tmux it's is a in curses based, so it is going to be in terminal. So yeah, you wouldn't need you wouldn't need anything um, graphical at all. Yeah. Uh, like in mode three, it does not work. Say that again. In mode three, like command mode. Yeah, yeah, three. all of that. Yeah, all of that would work. Yeah, inside a Tmux, it's basically just another terminal emulator, almost like it's a terminal emulator inside of a terminal emulator. Um, okay. So I've got to I've got to go get my config. So basically, to do this, I'm going to exit. When I exit here, I still have a buffer running, so it just exits that buffer, and then I'll exit that buffer as well. All right. Let me copy my config. So var share, um, and in here I've got um, tmux config. So I'm going to say tmux. And now I've got my Tmux config in here. And this is basically it. So I'm just setting theme. I've got a couple of, of things bound um, and so forth. But now it looks a little different. So we've got a different theme. And um, it's going to throw an error at the top. And that's OK, whatever. Um, at the bottom now, it's it's just a different, a completely different theme. And what I can do now is Control A, C makes a new creates a new buffer. And um, you know, if I run top over here, it just I think this this is a little cleaner. I've also got it set so that I can hold Shift down, and this is my own configuration. 
I can hold shift down and use the arrow keys to switch between buffers, which makes, I mean, it's just however you want to do it, which is the beauty of this text only stuff. All right, so with that, we looked at that. Why would I use Tmux over just using tabs in my uh, virtual terminal? Um, it's convenient, especially, I find it useful, like, personally, because on my, on my computer, I've got Windows open already, and I'm using my window manager to manage Windows. I don't really want to use my window manager to manage terminal sessions, um, because it's, it's already, I, once I'm in my, in my terminal, my hands are on the keyboard. I don't need to leave the keyboard. Um, the other thing is, in a remote session, if I'm on a server, which we're going to see in a second, um, it's convenient to have that because now I don't have the ability to have a window manager because I'm in a server somewhere else. Um, but I can have Tmux there and have four different sessions open. One's configuring something, one's connected to another server, um, one's checking the result of what I'm changing, and I can be on a remote server with three terminal sessions in the same window and just switching between them. Does that make any sense? Is that HDU screen a lot? Is there also the ability that if my SSH session gets severed, I can reconnect SSH and I'll have all those two right. sessions? Right, yes. Available? Yes, absolutely. Let me just, for the sake of for, uh, kind of answering that question, one of the first things I do in the morning is I get up and I, I basically run this command. I do an SSH um, to a 443. I have SSH on 443 on a Linode. So I'm using Linode and um, now this of course is the first time it's connected here from here. Um, so and you can see kind of from the, the profile um, the, the bash RC file there, it's it's a definitely a different server. So if I, from here, if I do a tmux um, list session, um, this is my this is my Linode box, so I've got an S1 where I do like more administrative stuff. I've got a study, which who knows what I was doing there. And um, then I've got a WeChat, which is where I have my WeChat client. So now I can attach to any of those at any time, and then detach, and I mean, I can be on any computer and access my WeChat, which we'll get to in a bit. But yes, definitely. That's and screen and Tmux. So they're really comparable. Screen does some things that uh, has a couple of features that Tmux doesn't have. Tmux has a couple of features screen doesn't have. They're pretty well. They pretty much do the same thing. If you're used to one, it makes sense to stay using that one. I think because it's there's a learning curve involved. Um, that's my my take on it. I like Tmux just because I feel more comfortable with it. Kind of like. I like Yamaha and not Suzuki, kind of one of those kinds of things. Um, anyways, all right, so that's Tmux. Any questions on Tmux but here before we move on? We can talk about that a little bit, but I want to get to the other things too. All right, so then we've got Ranger. Now, who uses Ranger? Oh, yay, I get to introduce <laughs> something. <laughs> that's exciting, all right. All right, so Ranger. So if I type Ranger, this is a file manager. So what it does is it basically gives me the ability to manage files, navigate, uh, just using the keyboard, using HJKL like I would in Vim. So since I'm familiar with Vim, that just kind of makes, makes a lot of sense. So I can just use, so H goes back, uh, and then um, L goes uh, forward right into the next one. And J goes down, K goes up, so I can move and navigate around. So for instance, if I want to go over to that var share and see what's in there, I can do that. And I can hit Control H just like I would in a regular window manager to see what's hidden and what's, you know, what's not there. Move up and down, and then it'll actually show me what's in there. This would be my MUT RC file, but I can't get MUT working because I didn't have time. So that's the reality of it. Um, so yeah, that is, that's Ranger. You can do a whole lot more with Ranger than I use it for. I use it mostly for navigation. 
you can select files and you can copy them, move them around. Um, you can, you know, copy and paste them, and, and just every. I mean, everything else that you would you would think you would do with a file manager and just kind of all keystrokes. Something is there a way to open it like in its respective? That's a good question. Yes. So, for instance, uh, u.png. It's a it's a image file. If I hit the right arrow, like I'm going to go into it, it opens it up in the default whatever it is. Um, in fact, with Ranger, if you're using Xterm, I believe, there's a couple of terminal emulators that, that allow it. Um, uh, GNOME Terminal does not, but you can actually have it, Ranger render, something else renders it, but Ranger shows the <laughs> image inside of the terminal, like it renders the whole image. Um, not pixelated, like actually the image renders it in, in the terminal. So Xterm definitely does it. Um, something to play with, for sure. It's pretty slick when it does that. Um, so like, whatever your default editor is, if I go up here and I say, okay, my vimrc, I push right. Um, it's like, oh, what do you want to use? Let's use, um, <coughs> let's use vim because I'm just used to it. But it'll, it'll do that for me. So now, um, I've selected vim as my editor for ranger. When I, when I navigate to those kinds of files, it just um, lets me edit them. You are being an integrated person. If you can tell me a program that can have my local machine on, listed like that on one side and a remote machine on the other, and to be able to easily move files back and forth. Oh, to move them back and forth between the two? Between the local and remote machines. Like SCPing back and forth. Like SCP yeah, and SCPing the files back and forth. Back and forth between the two. With, uh, with sort uh, of that end versus interface like that. Yeah, Synergy? that I don't know about. Synergy? Synergy. MC might do that. MC? Yeah. Any other questions? You said you're definitely looking to do it in a terminal? You yeah, said so you wanted to do that in the terminal? Yes. Okay. Never mind. Yeah. I mean, Dolphin I, does that basically. I was going to say FileZilla. Like FileZilla is looking for that too. I'm, I'm trying to copy to a really tiny embedded device. Oh, I see. Gotcha. Okay. That has no GUI whatsoever. Well, I mean, Ranger will allow you to do things like, you know, mark a file and copy it. So if you have something mounted, that'd be easy. Oh, no, if you can, like, do a, you know, not a remote file system. Yeah, I mean that would be the SSHFS would be the other way to attack mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's got four megabytes of um, non-volatile storage, so I don't have a lot of options for installing a program. Well, you've already got SSH remote. over there, right? I can, yeah. So that's all you need on that remote end. Okay. Okay, so uh, the way I use Ranger mostly is for navigation. So. The biggest problem I had right away was if I hit quit, if I hit Q right here to quit, uh, look where I am. So I'm back in my home directory. So that's not where I last was in Ranger. So what I wanted to do was open Ranger, and when I leave Ranger, wherever I was in Ranger is where I end up. So that's actually in my bashrc file. So let's uh, let's cat uh, var share bashrc. So at the end of my bash rc file here, I've got a little function, and I stole this off the internet. This isn't anything original to me. Um, basically, f I've got a function called ranger cd, which goes into um, the, and makes a little temp file that says, that it keeps writing to, it says, this is where I am, this is where I am, and then gets rid of it at the end. And then I just bind r um, to that function. So all I have to do then is hit r, and now I'm using ranger so let me demonstrate that real quick. Copy var share bash rc to dot bash rc. And then I have to exit because I'm in bash. Let's just get out and get back in. Now, if I hit R, it goes here, and um, I can navigate wherever I want. I'm going to go down here, and then I can hit Q to exit, and it's put me where I navigated to. So that once that once you get that kind of set up, it's kind of pretty because um, I can navigate from place to place visually without my hands leaving the keyboard. Um, so there's that one. Any questions on that before we go on? Okay. 
Uh, mutt is email. And um, it's a lot of it, it's a lot of work to get it configured well. I feel like um, I have it at work; it works well. Didn't have the time to set it up here for today, um, as you can see. So if I hit, if I just type mutt, it will kind of open it. Um, yes, we can do that. There's no mailbox open, um, but basically it's the same principle as like Ranger and all these others. But it's it's mail. It actually works with Exchange. Like it'll it'll read an Exchange mailbox just nice just like anything else would. Um, so the nice thing with Mutt is you can fly through your emails. I feel like you can read them faster and, and manage them easier because it's keystrokes and it's text. It will actually render uh, the text of an HTML email. There's a couple of things that you can add in there with, that convert HTML to text, and it just renders the text. Um, it also will take a PDF, and it will turn that into text. So if you get a PDF in, as an attachment, it's right there, and you're just able to read through it. So you can just glance at each of your emails, see the whole contents of it, and know what to do with it. So it's really, really powerful from that aspect. And also, it, it, saves kinda, it saves time from the fact that it's not rendering the whole email or the HTML or anything. It's basically just spitting out text. So um, at a keystroke, you can just go next, next, next and move through your email. Definitely something to look at and explore. Um, but since I can't show it to you because I don't have it working. Is um, it explicitly IMAP or top three or can it be configured to do uh, It's usually set up IMAP, but it does, I saw some some stuff in there about pop, so I'm pretty sure it can do pop too. All right, CalCurs. So I need a calendar, right? Because I need to manage, I mean, manage that as well. So. CalCurse, uh, Curse for and Curses. So it's basically, it's a calendar, but it uses Curses to draw it. Um, there is actually a better option. So if you're really into what I'm talking about here, and you want to look at something that's a little more advanced, that's a much steeper learning curve, but it has a, a few more better features, um, look at Remind. Um, the command you'd run for that is Rem. And on top of that, Word, W-Y-R-D. So Word is like the interface that's an NCURSES interface that sits on top of Remind. Um, that configuration is super powerful, but I'm just not there yet. What I use, and I still use this because it's, it's easy, really easy um, to get started with is uh, um, CalCurse. Now, this is the first launch. This is a first launch for CalCurse. What it's got at the bottom here is it says, hey, uh, we don't have any uh, files, you didn't have any configuration, so I went ahead and I created your configuration files for you. We're done. So you can hit enter, and we're in. Now, uh, I'm not super happy about the red. I can barely see it anyway, so I'm going to change that. So at the bottom there, it kind of tells you there's other commands here, so I'm going to hit O, and then O again, and down here there's a config. So if I hit uh, shift C to get that config, I can change all of my settings here. So I'm going to change my color with C, and let's make it green. Green is more exciting. And that's good. And hit Q. I'm going to go to Layout. So I can change the layout if I want. I kind of like the default anyway, but that's where it is. Quit. Quit. Uh, and it says, OK, data files were successfully saved. Uh, no, let's not. All right. So this is, this is CalCurse. In the upper right here is my calendar. And I can navigate this with the normal Vim HJKL. So as I move around here, I can pick a day. And you'll notice in the top left, the day is updating, like what day it is. It also has, if it's a full moon or a new moon or a half moon, um, that information gets put up there. I don't know how much you care about that. But as I move away from today, you'll notice that today is orange, uh, which is an interesting feature that you lose if you make your theme orange, because today is also orange. Um, so you can, u you can use an orange theme, but then you lose that. It's weird. Um, yeah, so let's add an event. So let's go back here. So if I hit Tab, I can switch between the three windows. Three windows are the calendar, the appointments, and the to-do. So the appointments have to have a specified time, and that's at a specific day. The to-do items are just always there, regardless of what day you're on. So the to-do items, it's kind of nice to have them there because if you just want to see uh, an active list of things that just need to get done until they're done, 
It's a great place to do that. So let's just quickly go through that. Appointments, if I hit A, I'm adding an appointment. So, and that's with the appointments window selected. So it wants a start time and an end time. So we're here, um, C plug started at 6.30, so it's gonna be 18.30 and it has to be kind of like that. And then, I don't know, uh, nine o'clock, so that's 2100. And what that did is you just created, very simply, uh, an appointment. So if I want to um, add another appointment, uh, 2100 to 2130, drive home, it's going to add my drive home event. So, and I can move be kind of between these, I can move up and down. If I want to edit them, I can just kind of select the one I want and I can edit it. Um, so it's pretty powerful. Any questions on that? I just started playing with this and put an appointment on the wrong day. How would you move it? So you can move it just like you would in, kind of like you would in Vim. If I have it selected, let's say I have C plug on the wrong day. If I hit D, it's going to say, do you really want to delete this? You say yes. And now let's tab, tab over to my calendar. Let's move it to Wednesday, hit tab, and hit P for paste. Now I've moved it there. So it's exactly like you would do it in Vim. <laughs> you can, you can. You have to script it though. There are people that are, have scripts out there that say, you know, it does this and run it. You can use cron to run it, but that's that's how you have to do it. Um, and you can do. There is support for things like WebDAV, so it does some pretty clever stuff too. Um, mostly, I use this for local calendar just because that's all I need it for. Um, but that. That works. Good question. Uh, I think that's it for Calcurs then. All right. And then WeChat. So we looked at that a little bit. Oh, another thing with Calcurs. If you're if you're using Calcurs, make sure that you save it. You have to either save it. So like in here, um, I have a change, and I let's say I make a change. I, I added a to-do item there. Okay, so now if I if I adjust my session crashes, I just close this window. I just close it like this. I want to close the terminal. If I do this, my to-do item is gone because I haven't saved it. So I either have to exit Calcurse, which prompts you, do you want to save the files? Yes, okay. Um, or just hit S to save it then. That's just something to note in Calcurse. All right. Um, WeChat, so I'm going to SSH. Now I use port 443. Anybody have an idea why I use port 443? Because it's open. So if I'm at here, where there's an AT&T network, <laughs> I can still SSH because port 22 is probably blocked. Um, okay. So if I do a TMOX list session again, I've got three, I've got this WeChat um, already working. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do TMOX attach session with a target of WeChat. So attach session dash T WeChat. What this does is it opens it up in WeChat, and there I am. Um, the text is so large it's not going to work. Let's see if. There we go. We can kind of see it a little better. All right. So uh, let's move up here. All right. So there's C plug. So I can I can move up and down. And again, WeChat is something that's. Let me explain WeChat real quick. So WeChat, you can install on um, on anything like the server side, and then you have a client side. So for me, I've got it out on Linode because that way I can. Um, Linode is always online. It's just it's never gonna, they're not going to go down unless they have a major disaster again, which I really don't think that's going to happen. Um, so Linode is always connected, and the the WeChat client is always running on um, on my Linode. So from anywhere, from any Linux box, I can connect to or Mac actually <laughs> because it's got Bash. Um, I can connect to my um, Linode and then just open up this 
this session here, and now I'm back in my IRC client. So this works for IRC or Slack. Like it has, you can connect with Slack as well. I think there's a couple other platforms that they that they have support for too. Um, but that's basically it. it's called WeChat. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I have an exchange student. They use that to communicate with their friends in China. Okay. Cool. Like Windows, Mac. Yeah, it's cross-platform. Yeah. And what's cool about that is uh, it actually has like a phone client. There's like an Android, and I don't know if they have iOS or not, but they might. Um, so there's a phone client. So I can pull up on my phone, just connect to this server, just some configuration settings, and you're good. And I can actually jump on IRC from my phone now because this is always online. And that way I don't miss things in the channel if, if I'm away. Um, so that's pretty nice. So that is, in a nutshell, that's kind of what I'm doing now with all of this. Everything is text. Um, I found it to be a whole lot more efficient. Alex is trying it now. He's, he's found it to be pretty efficient, um, like i3 at least. Oh, yeah. um, and of course, Vim looks like. So um, yeah, any questions about all of this? So may you just host this VChat like on your Linode that you, mm -hmm. what you ran out? Um, yeah, I just I just rent the Linode from from them and just spin it up and. And then so any any chat, RC chat, you join is going to be that IP versus the IP you're connected to from your home PC. That's, that's another point. added benefit. Yeah, nobody knows where I'm coming from, regardless of where I connect to it from, because I'm just connecting to that Linode. Anybody can have a Linode. Yeah, it's a good point. That can be a double-edged sword, though, because some people will rent like Linode and then spin up the bot. IRC clients there, and then so what happens is some IRC networks will just block like IP blocks, and so if you're on that block of IPs, yours could get banned even though you didn't actually do anything. Mm -hmm. So kind of a double-edged sword. It provides a, a little bit, I mean obviously you have your username, but it's like, provides a little bit of anonymity, but double-edged sword. Yep. Cool. I have a question. Yeah. With, with the, with the, the keyboard-based uh, windows and like that, actually shutting stuff down. Have you ever burned yourself with shutting one down when you didn't really intend to because it's so fast? That's a good question. Um, maybe like once, but not like it's not a normal phenomenon. Um, okay. It's actually it ends up being the 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 paradigm shift is in how do I close the window rather than oh no I closed the window. It's because everything, you have to set up a configuration to do X. So for everything, you're like, wait, how did I do that again? How did I, how did I exit the window manager again? I, you know, so it's, it's almost like uh, you don't accidentally do anything anymore. <laughs> I mean, every once in a while, you know, yes. But the biggest thing. The biggest problem that I've had while I was using i3 is instead of pushing like mod shift Q, which is the default quit, I push Control Shift Q, and that is like in some applications that's close all instances. Okay. And it was like close all my text editors. I'm like, wow, I had like five open. So I mean, now I yeah, save all my files. But it's going to be completely so dependent. Kind of more than it yeah. was, you know, the I wouldn't recommend this to anybody with dysgraphia, which is right. Like see it backwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, what was I going to say? It's um, there's definitely. So my biggest, it's definitely dependent on the configuration that you set, because you set all of the configuration. So for me, close is super C, because that makes sense to be super C means close. But that's really close to a lot of other things, like control C and control X, or, uh, and super X. And I set up super X, also my choice, to be the, the thing that locks the screen. So if that's going to lock the screen and I hit close instead of lock the screen, or I hit lock the screen instead of close, then I'm going to type my password again, then close the window, and then. <laughs> so that, but that's, you know, my own choice and my own pain as a result of that. That's, but that's probably the closest I've come to those kinds of mistakes. Anything else? All right, that's all I've got. So thanks for coming out.